tell you about Mr. Kirk Ellis. He is a two-time Emmy Award and two-time Humanitas Prize uh, winning writer and producer. He worked on uh, John Adams. He worked on David McCullough's 1976, uh, James Elroy's uh, American Tabloid, and the Emmy-nominated Into the West, uh, the Dreams DreamWorks series. Um, very recently, before all this kind of COVID stuff, of course he worked, and I hope everyone has seen it, uh, the program they do every year at the National Mall. And he, he, he has written and worked on that, and it is absolutely magnificent. I cannot thank him enough for his patriotism and his love in that project. So thank you for that. He is a former co-governor of the Writers Branch of the Academy of Tele Television, Arts, and Sciences, a past president of the Western Writers of America. He splits his time between Santa Fe, which I'm told is a high of 45 degrees, and not surprisingly, Palm Springs, which... <laughs> We're around 80 today, so thank you, Kirk. Come on up. We're very excited today to be talking about that secret weapon, the Navajo Code Talker. So thank you very much. Take it away. Now, I must say, this is the first stand-up lecture that I have done in over 14 months. It's nice not to be looking at everybody on a small Zoom screen. So I want to thank Greg for inviting me. Thank you to people who may be streaming at home. and listening to this later on YouTube. Greg mentioned a number of my, my film credits. I think one of the reasons that brings me here today, I looked at my notes for this lecture, and it turns out, and Greg, you may not remember this, I did a version of this lecture eight years ago. And new information has come out about the Navajo Code Talkers. I grew up in West Texas in El Paso, and I've lived my entire life in the Southwest, and it's impossible not to live in that area and not know about the incredible service of the, the Native Americans, specifically Navajo Marines, without whom the Pacific Campaign may have ended in a very, very different way. So it's a real pleasure to do them a little bit of honor and respect and tell you a little of their story today. So wars are fought, obviously, on, on the field of battle by the soldiers and the, and the generals who determine the strategy, but a lot of the war happens in intelligence, in knowing what the enemy's gonna do beforehand, and being able to counter those particular intentions. And that is done through codes, messages that are transmitted in cryptograms, in ways that make it very difficult for the enemy to determine what the actual message is. Here's the problem though. Virtually every, virtually every code constructed in modern warfare has been broken. We've all seen the story of the Bletchley Park women who broke the German code, the Enigma machines, things like that. But there's only one that was never broken by the enemy. In fact, it's the only unbroken code in military history throughout uh, Western civilization. And that is the Navajo code, which is what we're going to talk about today. And just to give you a little bit of context, we're focusing on the Navajos and their code, but the use of the Navajo language in World War II was not the first time the American military brought Native Americans into the intelligence service to fight for democracy. This group here, these are Choctaw veterans of World War I. The Choctaw were brought in in the, the brutal campaign for the Argonne Forest. Um, in the worst days of World War I, where they literally transmitted messages in their own language, using Choctaw instead of English, to elude German code breakers. And there were not just Choctaws, there were Comanches who served in the 4th Infantry Division in World War I, there were Hopis, there were Lakota, many of them doing this sort of piecemeal. What happened was, after the war, we made a mistake and we announced that we had used these tribespeople as our code bearers. So the Germans began to send students, I'm putting all this in quotation marks, and anthropologists to these reservations, to the Choctaw and the Comanche Reservation, essentially to do field work. And what they were actually doing was coming up with a written language in those, in those native dialects that if we use them again, they would have the secrets to. But 
there was one language that that simply made it impossible for a spy, an intelligence officer, to gain a foothold, and that was Navajo. Now, why is that? If you've ever traveled through the Southwest between Flagstaff and Gallup, roughly, you can turn on a station called KNDN, and it is broadcast entirely in Navajo, with the occasional English word for a used car company or an insurance outfit uh, to get people to buy things. And it's, a, it's an extremely complex language that builds on sounds. There is no sort of sentence in Navajo, there's simply a word that gets stretched as long as it needs to be. It is a tonal language, like Chinese, where if you say something this way, it means something that if you say it this way. And there is, a, there is a different tone for I am talking, I will talk, I am about to talk, I spoke yesterday, all just in tones. And because the Navajo, who occupy the largest reservation in America, encompasses four states, were still fairly isolated in their communities, there was not a lot of broadcasting of the language outside the family circle. So, in 1940, fewer than 30 people outside the tribe could even speak a handful of Navajo words. And none of them were written down. There were missionaries who tried to use phonetic translations of the Bible from time to time, but there was not a sort of codified dictionary of the Navajo language. We're talking about a group of Native Americans who perform this service, this duty, this sacrifice for their country. And I want to put that in some context here. Native Americans weren't even recognized as persons in the United States until 1879. In many states, they weren't even citizens um, at the time that, that Pearl Harbor was struck. They could be, in some states, if they gave up all tribal claims to the land, mineral rights, all of that. Uh, in, in the United States, Indians were granted citizenship in 1924, but Western states, like the one I live in, in New Mexico, continue to find ways to disenfranchise them. So you had situations where many Native American GIs came back and they still couldn't vote. They couldn't vote in Arizona, for instance, until 1954. But this was a warrior culture. And when asked to serve and when they felt that they were under threat or the country that had sort of absorbed them, taken over their land and their, their, their lives, was a threat they would fight, as they did in World War I. Uh, they became among the most patriotic of volunteers, and especially the Navajo, and we'll talk about those numbers as we get a little bit deeper into the story. And this was largely a pastoral culture. It was, it was a, they, they raised sheep, uh, some raised cattle, uh, they made their living, some as silversmiths, some as weavers. But the Navajos had a particularly thorny history with the U.S. government. Um, in 1864, they were chased off their tribal homeland into a place in northeastern Arizona called Canyon de Shea by Kit Carson under the orders of a general named James Carleton, who's one of the great human heroes back east. And essentially what Carson did was eradicated all of their crops, burnt down their peach trees, and killed all their animals. And they were herded up, and they were marched across two states to a godforsaken stretch of the eastern New Mexico landscape known as the Bosque Redondo, uh, also known as Fort Sumner. It's famous in Western history, for instance, as the place where Pat Garrett shot Billy the Kid. And they lived essentially under concentration camp conditions for four years until the U.S. government, led by William Tecumseh Sherman, brokered a treaty that essentially restored them to 
their tribal homeland, the reservation that they occupy today. So to give you some statistics, 8,500 people went from Canyon de Chelly to the Bosque de Dondo on what was known as the Long Walk. Only 6,000 of them returned. And this is from a, a tribal population that was 10 times as great in the, in the decades and centuries preceding the American occupation of the Southwest. More recently, in the early 1930s, uh, they, they underwent something that was called the, the Stock Reduction Program that was created by the Bureau of Interior with all good intentions. And we know what happens when government operates with good intentions. The idea was there are too many sheep on the land, too many cattle, we need to thin them out. So we're going to pay people to sell us their cattle or destroy their livestock, and we will replace that stock with more, the phrase we would now use is more genetically engineered stock, sheep that would have more wool, cattle that would have more meat. But this went against all Navajo tradition where stock was wealth. If you owned a lot of, a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep especially, you were a leading member of your community. So there was very little cooperation. What the government then did was they sent out stock inspectors who counted up the sheep and the cattle, determined how many could be sustained on the land. Then they dug pits, big pits, sort of the size of from where I'm standing to that helicopter. They rounded up all the cattle and sheep in, into these, these deep pits. There were sharpshooters and riflemen all the way around, and they killed all of that livestock and then just bulldozed earth over. And this was a huge trauma for the Navajo. But still, less than 10 years later, when our country was attacked, they stepped up and volunteered for service. And, the, and I want to show you this photo from the reservation. This is from Fort Wingate, which is on the Navajo Reservation on the Arizona-New Mexico border. These are volunteers signing up uh, at Fort Wingate to go to basic training at Camp Pendleton. And here's how they came to be recruited as Marines for combat and communication duty in the Pacific. There was a missionary son by the name of Philip Johnston who had been raised on the Navajo Reservation, and he learned to speak fluent Navajo. And at age nine, uh, he, was, he met Teddy Roosevelt when uh, TR journeyed with the Navajo delegation to Washington, pleading for fair treatment by the US government. And this nine-year-old boy, who Roosevelt met on the reservation at Trading Post, was actually the official translator for the delegation. And he followed World War I, he was a uh, young man at that time, sort of a teenager, with, with great interest. And he became aware of the use of, by the U.S. Army of the Choctaw and the Comanche to, um, uh, as, as, as coat bearers. And he thought, well, there's no language word. I know Navajo. It's a very, very difficult language to learn. Adults really can't learn it. You have to learn it from the cradle upwards. And he later approached the U.S. Marine Corps with the idea of using Navajo as a code language for the upcoming conflict. And jumping to the chase just for a second, he's a civilian, civilian with big ideas. Navajo? Why would we use Navajo? And he said, look, let me do this. Let me bring four members of the Navajo tribe who I know through my family. Let me bring them here to Camp Pendleton and let's try them out against your machines and whatever white uh, code, op code officers you may have. So the challenge was to translate a set of orders into Navajo, relay them to a radio man on the other end, who then translated the message back into English in its original form. Now, the Marines thought this was going to be a matter of hours, if not 
half hours, or half days, or full days. In fact, the Navajo who, who Johnston brought to the camp on February 28, 1942, managed to translate those codes in two and a half minutes. And that impressed even the Marine Corps. And they said, okay, we will now start an active recruitment of Navajo from the reservation. But there were certain restrictions. They had to be fluent Navajo speakers. It was not necessary that they knew fluent English. They couldn't know trader English, that sort of pidgin English that is used to communicate with white traders and business people on the reservation, even, even to this day. So, a number of, of, of Navajo volunteer, you're seeing them take swearing in here before they go to Camp Pendleton, 29 were chosen out of, the, uh, out of all the people who volunteered as the initial group of Navajo who were going to establish this important code. They became what was known as the 382nd platoon of the 1st Division of the U.S. Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton. And you have to understand, for most of them, this was their first time off the reservation. For many of them, the first time they'd even been outside their family unit within the reservation. The first time many of them had had any contact whatsoever with white men, except for those who had been to boarding school. So there were stereotypes on both sides. When they first came into Camp Pendleton, you'll see this here, this is on their arrival. Um, the, the, the officer who ushered them in to basic training wrote a report to his superiors and he described them, this is the language of the 1940s, as magnificent specimens of the original American manhood. It was still that sort of noble savage idea so they're here, we're going to put them through basic training, what are, you know, what are, what, you know, what are they really going to do for us? Now all the Navajo were told was they were being recruited for special duty, special services. And one of the original code talkers was a man named Carl Gorman. And those of you who know uh, Native American art will know the name of his son, R.C. Gorman, one of the great uh, Navajo artists. His father was one of the original co talkers And he said, we didn't know what special duty was, but we agreed it probably meant wearing dress blues and sitting behind a desk all day. That turned out not to be the case. So there was a lot of suspicion about whether or not these young Navajo men would be proper Marines, whether they could make it through basic training. And there were certain major cultural obstacles. And I'll give you one. Those who are Marines or anybody who's been through basic training will understand this right away. It was considered the height of rudeness in Navajo culture to look somebody directly in the eye. You never spoke to them directly. So imagine dealing with your drill sergeant <laughs> and not being able to look, you know, look him in the eye and having to be forced constantly to be looked in the eye. And you were never, ever supposed to raise your voice. And anybody who raised his voice to you was automatically considered an enemy. Again, not the best sort of cultural imprinting for basic training. But the Navajo were able to sort of process that in their cadence, because when they did that one, two, three, four cadence, the, na the numbers of Navajo didn't actually work out. And because the drill instructors didn't know what they were saying, they came up with a completely obscene cadence for marching. It was all about the drill instructor and what a rotten bastard he was. So, so that's Indian humor for you on this. But just to give you an example of how, how they excelled at what they did, after three weeks of rifle training, this platoon of 29, it's an oversized platoon, scored a 93% marksmanship record, and it is still one of the best records in the entire U.S. Marine Corps. So, 
A testimonial was written to them after the end of basic training, and the, and the officer in charge, the Sigma Corps officer, wrote, as general duty Marines, the Navajo are without peer. As individuals and as a group, these people are scrupulously clean, neat, and orderly. They quickly learn to adapt themselves to the conditions of the service. They are quiet and uncomplaining. In short, Navajos make good Marines, and I should be very proud to commend a unit composed entirely of these people. So they earned their respect. And they figured after this grueling basic training, they earned a little leave and are in San Diego. So imagine their surprise when these 29 men are told, uh, no, now you're going on a bus, we're gonna send you to Camp Elliott where you're going to perform your special service. So from the moment they are inducted into service until they come out of service after Peleliu and Okinawa and Iwo Jima and service in Japan, until then, they are never on a break for the entire war because of their value to the service. So they don't know what the service is. They're put into a room on their arrival at Camp Elliott and told, guys, here's the deal. We want you, no pressure, but you're not coming out of the room until this happens. We want you to use your language and come up with a code that we can use to transmit all military messages in the Pacific. That's it. So, you know, let us know when you got it and, uh, you know, we'll come in and, and bring, you know, refreshments and, and sandwiches. And the recruits are stunned because, remember, many of these men went to boarding school where they were forcibly removed from their families by representatives of the BIA uh, and the Department of Education and they were taken to boarding schools far from their families, far from their homes, some of them as far as Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the very first of the uh, Native American boarding schools. And once there, they were severely punished if they ever spoke a single word of their own language. They were whipped, their mouths were washed out with, with soap, brutally. Little kids, five, six years old, who were going to boarding school, who could not speak their language. Their hair is cut, they're dressed in white clothes. So think of the irony of now being told, okay, yeah, there was that, but now your language is going to help save our country from the aggressors in the South Pacific, the Japanese. But it's up to you to figure out how this code works. So they didn't know what was going to happen. By the end of the first day, they had over a hundred words. And by the time this program really kicked into gear, and they were sent overseas, there were 400 words that they had created using their own language for various aircraft, artillery, officers. So I'll give you some examples. They had to look at planes, and this is actually a perfect spot to be doing this. They had to look at, at the shape of aircraft. So they looked at an observation plane, and their word for it was the Navajo word for owl. Owl is always observing. Looked at fighter plane, moves quickly, really quickly, so you can you know, almost undetectably at, at times. Hummingbird was their word for that. A battleship, that was an easy one for them. Whale, Beshla is the word in Navajo. That was their word for a battleship. A minesweeper, this is one of my favorites, was called a beaver. Anybody want to guess why? Because the beaver's tail just sweeps like this. Now, they had to do officers. So what they did with the officers was they looked at what they were wearing on their shoulder. So a, a colonel became a silver eagle. A major was an oak leaf. Then they came up with words for the enemy. They started with the European enemy. 
Hitler became mustache smeller. <laughs> Mussolini was gourd chin. And they came up with these for Hirohito and, and all the other enemies that we encountered along the way. So you get the basic idea. So there's, just think about it for a second. You're a, you're a Japanese signal officer. And even if you knew what the word was, if you had any understanding of Navajo, the message came, Silver Eagle, Owl, Chicken Hawk. What is that? But they got, they got even better at it. They started doing it with the letters. They took the entire English alphabet, and for every letter, they came up with three Navajo words that any code talker could use at random at any time for transmitting messages. And this was a key breakthrough because what makes a code breakable is repetition. That's how, that's how the, the British broke the German code with the Enigma machine because they realized things would be transmitted one week a certain way and then it would go one notch up on their code machine and they translated that and they translate trans trans things that way. With Navajo, any given day, any given order, could be one of these three letters, one of these three words for all these things. That's how the code remained unbroken. Now, this was a secret mission, and it was so secret, and this is the US military in action, that not even the commanders of the field were told what the Navajos were doing in their unit. So, the first place they're sent is Guadalcanal, right? Um, and this was, they were part of the second wave. Now, the, the brief history there, uh, prior to the Navajo's arrival is, we were looking, as we always were throughout the Pacific, to gain hold of an airstrip, deprive the enemy of a, of a place to, to island hop, give us a place to refuel, and continue this campaign across the Pacific to Japan. And when the Marines landed on Guadalcanal, there was no initial opposition. But once they were there, they were constantly pummeled by artillery fire from the Japanese ships and guerrilla attacks from the embedded Japanese already on the island. So, 13 co-talkers arrived in Well Canal uh, with the first wave of re reinforcements. They report to General Alexander Vandergrift, who literally, his first response is, who the hell are you guys? Oh, okay, your, your communications officers? I'm going to send you to my signal commander. So, the signal corps commander is totally skeptical of these Navajos claim to be co-talkers. He says, well, I have to have some proof of what you guys do. So I'm going to put you up against our machines. He did. The machines took four hours to decode a message, and the Navajos did it in under two minutes. Because, okay, okay, there's got to be something wrong here. You guys are using sign language, like, you know, the Kimo Sabi stuff I see in the, uh, in the movies, to talk to each other. So I'm going to put you in separate rooms so you can't even see each other when these messages are being written out. Same thing happened. He was convinced. So, cutting to the chase, this first group of co-talkers goes through Guadalcanal, and they are so successful in what they do that Major Vandergriff then requests another 80 co-talkers for Guadalcanal and subsequent battles across the Pacific. By April 1942, and this program has just started in February, okay, the Marines are recruiting 25 Navajo a month. And by the end of the war, there will be 540 Navajo Marines serving in the Pacific, and of those, we're not sure of the exact number, 375 to 420 of them are actual co-talkers. Now, there's a secret about their service, which is that, unbeknownst to them, each co-talker was surreptitiously assigned a Marine, a white Marine, to shatter him everywhere he went. Because 
these guys weren't just on the ships radioing orders. They were with the advanced artillery companies. They were with the advanced rifle companies, um, as you can see here. They were in the field fighting as well as transmitting messages. The white bodyguards were told it is the code that must be protected. None of these guys can fall into enemy hands. Now, the order was not given directly, but the implication was if you, any of these guys are at risk of being captured, shoot, they cannot be allowed to be tortured by Japanese. And in fact, um, that was never, that, that never had to be applied because none of them were ever captured by the Japanese. The irony is, they were often captured by their own guys. Uh, when they first arrived, because the Japanese who were on these islands would take the uniforms of dead, uh, dead Marines, put them on, and infiltrate the camps. So when many of the Navajo arrived, and they're like in a chow line, reaching for an orange juice, which they haven't seen in six months, they're captured. They're, they're brought in until some senior officer can say, no, 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 these guys are with us. That was something that virtually every code talker in the Pacific experienced at least once in some fashion. So, for three years, these, these men fight, and they're in every major campaign in the Pacific. Just to list them for a quick second here. Here you see them in action. This is a post photograph um, taken in Guam here. These are actually two cousins who volunteered together. They're at Cape Gloucester, they're at Tower, they're at Saipan, they're at Tinian, they're at Peleliu. But their, their finest hour comes at Iwo Jima. It was said by the Signal Corps officer that in charge of communications for that entire campaign, that without the Navajo talkers, the Marines simply could not have taken Iwo Jima. And this was something that was not known for almost 50 years after these guys served. Now, a couple more cultural things that the Navajo had to deal with in the war. Uh, among Native American cultures, the Navajo are particularly fearful of a dead body, to the extent which if somebody, including a very close relative, your mother, your husband, your son, your grandson, your granddaughter, dies in your house, you can't live in the house anymore. You have to knock out the walls and burn the house down. That was the old tradition. So the Navajo recruits who were seeing a lot of death in the Pacific had to make their peace with that. The Japanese who would, in a bonsai attack, leap into a foxhole. And the, the co talker would, would kill this enemy person and didn't have to be in that foxhole for days, a week or more having the fear of a dead body. But they all had medicine bags, and the, the contents of your medicine bag was a secret to you. It was, it, there was corn pollen for sure, but whatever else you put in there would be your protection against these evil spirits that you would, you would contact through the course of your service. And they all kept them, and they kept them throughout the war. So in Iwo Jima, Again, that term, for those of you who don't know, means sulfur island. Iwo Jima was misleadingly solid with Mount Suribachi above it. The entire floor of the island was deep, thick, volcanic ash, like quicksand. And when the Marines, the first wave of Marines hit, the transports bogged down. The men who got off the transports bogged down. There was, a, there was a huge traffic jam. We had bombarded Iwo Jima for seven months, softened it up as it were. Um, we used 6,900 bombs and 22,000 rounds of naval shells, almost more that was used in the entire European campaign in World War II to soften up this island. It was strategically important to us because we were getting this close to Tokyo. But 
our bombers, like the ones you see here, were often taking severe hits and they had no place to land. They would have to just ditch the planes and hope for the best on their way back from Tokyo. We needed that island and we needed to take it away from the Japanese so they did not have a similar advantage. The same story all the way across the Pacific. They had, there was a last man standing order that had gone out among the Japanese troops. You couldn't see anything there. You couldn't see any massed enemy force. But there were thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of tunnels. The battle for the island would last 36 days and it would result in 26,000 American casualties, including 6,800 killed. We made the assault with 70,000 Marines launched from 450 vessels, and every single order given during this entire campaign that lasted over a month was made by Navajo co-talkers, both on the ships and in the field. In the first 48 hours of Iwo Jima, I'll use a shot here, this is actually Carl Gorman, R.C. Gorman's father, uh, on uh, Iwo with uh, doing some forward spotting. So in the first 48 hours, six Navajo radio operators, six of them, worked around the clock, sending and receiving 800 messages. And they sent and received them without a single error. And by, with that, by no error, I mean not a semicolon, not a full stop, nothing out of place. It went exactly the way it was supposed to. And it's even more remarkable when you consider that these messages were being transmitted under really serious heavy enemy fire. And because it was an oral language, they had to have everything in their head at all times. And the code, I set the microphone down for this, has recently been published. This is the official Navajo Code Talker manual that was given out um, at the end of their service. And this code, both sides. And all of that was committed to memory. And think about having to remember all this stuff when you're close to getting your head taken off by a shell or a grenade. So in the end, there were, at the end of the war, only nine co-talkers killed in action. Two were wounded and later died of their injuries. Their story has never really been told by Hollywood. I am deliberately burying the memory of a terrible Nicolas Cage film made by John Woo called Wind Talkers. And leave it to Hollywood, when there's a chance to do the story, they make it about the wrong damn character. They make it about the white bodyguard and not about the co-talker himself. So the story has not fully been told yet. These guys entered the war as PFCs, Private First Class. Do you want to guess what rank they came out of the war? <laughs> Private's first class, because of an error in Marine Corps bureaucracy, because nobody knew about them, they could never advance through the ranks, no matter what their service was. They were told, when they decommissioned, you can never tell anybody about the service. You can't tell your family, you can't tell anybody in the press, you can't even tell your fellow soldiers what you did, even if they're other Navajo. If you didn't know about them, you can't tell them because we may need you again. And they did. They were called back to Korea, and they were called back in the early stages of Vietnam. And they continued to serve. And remember, many of these guys came back not eligible for the GI Bill, still couldn't vote in Arizona and New Mexico had done this amazing service, and they were never properly recognized for it. 
The code was not declassified until 1969, in fact. And that was only acknowledged by the United States Marine Corps. There wasn't a sort of national announcement from the White House or from the Department of Defense. In December 71, Richard Nixon presented the surviving code talkers with a certificate of appreciation. And in 1976, the code talkers led both the Bicentennial Parade and later Jimmy Carter's inaugural parade. This is Window Rock, Arizona. It's the capital of the Navajo Nation. And there's only one statue in the entire government complex. And this is it. It's a Navajo code talker with that 30 pound hand crank radio that they had to use throughout the war, uh, kneeling uh, in transmitting a message. And this is where the Marine Corps and Code Talker reunions take place or have taken place in preceding years. So on, in 1982, Ronald Reagan declared August 14th of that year National Code Talker Recognition Day. And that day was specifically chosen. That was the day Jack Japan surrendered in the war in 1945. VJ Day. So you have to understand this is taking place now over the course of almost 30 years, just the recognition. In December 2000, Congress, under Clinton, uh, passed and, and Clinton signed the authorization to award the Code Talkers finally, in the year 2000, finally, the Gold Medal of Honor. And those awards were then were not presented until July of 2001 by then President George W. Bush. And there were only 29 talkers who were, the original 29, most of whom had, uh, had died, were possibly presented with medals. And there were only three of the four remaining co talkers who were physically able to be present for that. So when I gave this lecture years ago, I pointed out that there were fewer than, of all these, these 400 co talkers, at that time, there were fewer than 20. Four months ago, there were five. One has since passed. Now, of all those co-talkers, there is only four. Only four remaining. One of them is, is named Thomas Begay, and we had hoped to do a tribute to him and the co-talkers at the 2020 National Memorial Day concert, which was unfortunately uh, reformatted uh, as a non-live event due to COVID, and it's coming back again this year in a very similar format. They have since dedicated on the mall a monument to the Native Americans who fought in World War II. It's there with the other memorials for that conflict. But it, 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 it was inaugurated very quietly in the midst of COVID, and not a lot of people know about it yet. So their service still remains to be recognized. So what did the co talkers do when they came home? There was no fanfare for them. There couldn't be. Nobody can know of their service. They went back to traditional medicine. All the code talkers had their families perform what was called an enemy way to cleanse them of the horrors that they've seen. And for many of them, it prevented them from having recurrent bouts of PTSD. It was that triumph of traditional over the white man's medicine. And many of them went back to their, their, their regular lives. And I want to end um, with the, the, the prayer that was done for them in the, uh, in the cleansing ceremony. While you see some of the pictures of these survivors, there's a wonderful book. I don't know if it's for sale here in the, the bookshop called Warriors by a Japanese-American photographer named Kenji Kawano, who came to know the Code Talkers while he was living in New Mexico and created really the only photo document that we have of all of these men in their service. So let me just get the prayer, and as I'm reading that, I'll try to do this to your hand. You'll see the... If I do that, can you hear me? Okay, great. So this is the prayer. 
In beauty I walk. With beauty before me I walk. With beauty behind me I walk. With beauty around me I walk. With beauty above me I walk. With beauty below me I walk. In beauty, all is made whole. In beauty, all is restored. In my youth, I am aware of it. In an old age, I shall walk quietly the beautiful trail. In beauty, it is begun. In beauty, it is ended. Those Navajo co-talkers. Thank you all for your attention.